Hello and welcome to Moments in History. I'm Linda Shenton Matchett, author, speaker, and history geek. While researching my stories, I unearth tons of intriguing historical information that does not end up on my books. So I've created this channel to share those tidbits with you. I really appreciate you stopping by to watch. Germany never invaded the United States during World War II, but hundreds of thousands of her troops ended up here, nonetheless, as prisoners of war. Captured in all theaters of war, many were taken by U.S. forces, while others were captured by British armies and then transferred to American camps when, withholding, when holding facilities in the U.K. became overcrowded. Despite this, America's first POW in World War II was not German, but Japanese. He was the only surviving pilot of one of five mini-subs that were to penetrate the inside of Pearl Harbor under the cover of darkness before the attack began. The mission was to surface and fire the torpedoes during the aerial attack. Then they would dive and escape the harbor and then rendezvous with their mother submarines, again under cover of darkness during the night of December 7th. However, the plan failed and Kazuo Sakamaki was captured along with his sub. The first full-scale POW camps in the U.S. opened on February 1, 1943, in Crossville, Tennessee, Hereford and Mexia, Texas, Ruston, Louisiana, and Weingarten, Missouri. By the end of the war, 511 area camps and approximately 175 smaller branch camps existed in 46 of the 48 states. Most of the camps were located in the south and southwest regions of the country because of the higher expense of heating barracks in colder areas. My own state of New Hampshire was the home of one lonely camp in the town of Stark. At its peak in May of 1945, a total of 425,871 POWs were held in the U.S. Of that number, 371,683 were German, 50,273 Italian, and 3,915 Japanese. Some of the camps were designated segregation camps, where Nazi true believers were separated from the rest of the prisoners, whom they had been terrorizing and even killing for being friendly with their American captors. The U.S. was reluctant to accept Britain's POWs at first. Frankly, the military was not prepared for basic logistical considerations, such as food, clothing, and housing requirements. They, and also, they had had brief experience with a limited POW population in the last war. Almost all German-speaking Americans were engaged overseas directly in combat efforts, and the American government feared the presence of Germans on U.S. soil would create a security problem and raise fear among civilians. As a result, newspaper coverage of the camps and public knowledge were intentionally limited until the end of the war. The prisoners were usually shipped to America in Liberty ships, returning home that would otherwise be empty, with as many as 30,000 prisoners arriving per month to New York or Virginia, where they were then processed to be distributed to the camps. While the ships risked being sunk by German U-boats on the ocean, good treatment began with substantial meals served aboard. Upon arriving, the comfort of the Pullman cars that carried the prisoners to the camps amazed the Germans, as did the country's large size and undamaged prosperity. Under the direction of the Office of Provost Marshal General, Guidelines mandated placing the compounds away from urban industrial areas for security purposes, in regions with mild climates to minimize construction costs, and at sites where POWs could alleviate anticipated farm labor shortages. Other than barbed wire and watchtowers, the camps resembled standard U.S. or German military training sites, with prisoners segregated by service branch and rank. The Geneva Convention required the U.S. to provide living quarters comparable to those of its own military, which meant 40 square feet for enlisted men and 120 square feet for officers. If prisoners had to sleep in tents while their quarters were constructed, so did the guards. The three admirals and 40 generals in custody were sent to Camp Clinton and Camp Shelby in Mississippi, where each had his very own bungalow with a garden. The Geneva Convention also mandated equal treatment for prisoners 
which meant they were paid American military wages. They could work on farms or elsewhere only if they were paid for the labor, and officers could not be compelled to work. The minimum pay for enlisted soldiers was 80 cents, which equivalent to $14 in 2022 wages, roughly equivalent to the pay of an American private. Part of the wages actually helped pay for the POW program. The workers could use the rest of the camp, camp at the camp team where fellow prisoners sold snacks, reading materials, playing cards, and tobacco products. Now they were paid in scrip. All hard currency was confiscated with other personal possessions during the initial processing for return after the war. Because after all, money could be used during escape attempts, something I certainly had not thought about. Labor unions were largely opposed to the use of the prisoner workers, citing the War Manpower Commission's rules that required union participation in worker recruitment wherever possible. However, Given the wartime labor shortage, especially in agriculture, their opposition was a moot point. The government lives and dies by its paperwork, so twice a month, each prisoner of war camp was required to fill out the WDAGO Form 1921 and mail it to the office of the Provost Marshal General in Washington. Germans were responsible for waking their own men, marching them to and from meals, and preparing them for work their routine successfully recreating the feel of military discipline for the prisoners. Several camps had held social receptions with local uh, Germans, with local American girls, and some Germans met their future wives while there as prisoners. Many prisoners found their living conditions were far better than it would be if they were civilians in Germany, with prisoners eating the same rations as American soldiers, again required by the Geneva Convention. Special meals were held, especially on Thanksgiving and Christmas, and one German POW wrote later, When I was captured, I weighed 128 pounds. After two years as a POW, I weighed 185. I've gotten so fat, you can no longer see my eyes. Prisoners were provided with writing materials, art supplies, woodworking utensils, and musical instruments, and were allowed regular correspondence with family in Germany. They held frequent theatrical and musical performances. Prisoners had private radios and movies were shown as often as four nights a week. The cinema often serving as re-education and a propaganda tool as well as entertainment. With many Hollywood anti-Nazi films such as the cartoon Hair Meets Hair and the Why We Fight series. After the liberation of the Nazi concentration camps, Films of the atrocities of the Holocaust were shown. Prisoners were expected during wartime to attempt to escape, but less than 1% of all prisoners of war in America attempted that, less than the rate in the civilian prison system, and most were unsuccessful. There was one large escape on December 23rd of 1944 when 25 German POWs broke out of Arizona's Camp Papago Park by crawling along a 178-foot tunnel. However, by January, the escapees were caught, in part because a river they intended to travel down by raft turned out to be a dry riverbed. Hmm. Although they expected to go home immediately after the war in 1945, the majority of German prisoners continued working in the U.S. until 1946, arguably violating the Geneva Convention's requirement of rapid repatriation then spending up to more than three years as laborers in France and the United Kingdom. However, most Germans left the U.S. with positive feelings about the country, a familiarity with the language, and often several hundred dollars in earnings, which then benefited the post-war German economy. Many Germans requested permission to stay and even applied for citizenship. Some, who had been born in the U.S. and already had citizenship, had been conscripted on trips back to Italy or Germany prior to the entry into the war. Unfortunately, their hearings were delayed until all were returned to the nation where they served. After repatriation, about 5,000 Germans emigrated to the United States, and thousands of others returned to visit. I hope you've enjoyed today's moment in history. If you'd like to learn even more history, please stop by my blog that's found on my website at www.lindashentonmatchett.com and please consider subscribing to my channel 
and click on the bell icon below to receive notifications of new episodes that release on the second and fourth Fridays of each month. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of your day.